Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and I'm delighted to see so many of you. I would like to talk about how evolutionary thinking can help us to understand ADHD. I am a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I work in Hertfordshire. I see patients with ADHD, amongst other difficulties. So there are few disorders in psychiatry which are mired in controversy to the same extent as ADHD. But there are a few things we agree about. We agree that it's characterized by inattention and hyperactivity, impulsivity. It's significantly more common in boys. The, uh, the ratios vary. So in Norway, they describe a 3 to 1 boy to girl ratio. In Austria, it's up to 16 to 1. We know that there is a significant overlap with autism spectrum disorders and other neurodevelopmental disorders, and this has led to ADHD being put under neurodevelopmental disorders in the recent DSM-5, whereas previously it was under uh, behavioral disorders in the DSM-4, where it was associated with oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. But I assume that many of you haven't actually seen a child with ADHD, so I th I thought I'd play this little video and ask you if you can spot the child with ADHD. <laughs> you've seen that video, I assume that most of you look at that boy and think, oh, what a sweetie, and you can see how he feels so passionate and so energetic and, and really is singing with his heart and soul. But if you look at it from the teacher's perspective, you can see how it might be a bit troublesome, and that little girl next to him, did any of you actually see her? Or was all your attention focused on the boy? <laughs> So it can be very difficult to, to, folk, to manage in a group setting. And there are lots of things we disagree about regarding ADHD. There are huge arguments about the prevalence. So some people say it's underdiagnosed and we should be diagnosing more children. Other people say it's massively overdiagnosed and we know there are huge differences. So in the United States, at least 9% of all children are diagnosed with ADHD, whereas in France, the prevalence is less than 0.5%. Even in countries that are very similar, for example, Denmark and Iceland, in Denmark, the prevalence is about 1%, and in Iceland, it's 3.8%. So there are questions which need to be answered. Another big bone of contention is the cause. Is it biological? Is it genetic? We know there's some heritability. Or is it environmental? And many <laughs> colleagues will say that it's just a result of child maltreatment and of difficult childhoods. And that then leads to huge arguments around treatment. Should we be medicating these children or should we be offering therapy? And I, I think that evolutionary thinking can help us. So with my co-authors, we wrote a paper which I'll, is in the packs and which I um, will give you the, the reference of at the end. But we believe that the traditional disease model is less than ideal for making sense of the effects of early childhood experiences on development. And we argue that a model based on evolutionary thinking can deepen understanding by showing how behaviors tend to occur for reasons that are evolutionarily adaptive, even if these might appear pathological. So what we're trying to do is to say, let's look at ADHD from a different viewpoint, not just as a 
child psychiatric disorder, <coughs> but why, why does it exist? What strengths might it have? So if we think of ADHD traits as an adaptation, we know that according to evolutionary thinking, behavior traits that have, had, that have survived and been passed down the generations must have had adaptive value in the past, otherwise they wouldn't exist. And possibly there are still adaptive values today. So one example of this is the Ariol tribe in Kenya. So about a seventh of them have the long version of the dopamine D4 receptor gene, the DRD4 gene. This gene is associated with novelty seeking. So you can imagine that if these people are faced with a drought, for example, and they then have to find either greener pastures or perhaps face starvation and possibly death, having a novelty seeking trait which actually allows you to take risks, to do something different, to be active, might offer survival value and allow people to procreate, like in the second picture. We know that carriers of the long repeat allele of the DRG4 gene are more likely to have ADHD symptoms. And we f also know that they are more sensitive to the effects of the environment, including the quality of parenting. So in the differential susceptibility model, we know that not all people are equally susceptible to changes in the environment. Some people are more plastic than others. That means they are more sensitive to environmental changes, good or bad. <coughs> and what this model shows us is that children who have a tendency um, towards ADHD with the DRG4 gene tend to be more sensitive to the environment. So with a harsh environment, they do worse, but equally with a warm, nurturing environment, they do better. Life history theory can also help us understand how people with ADHD, like traits, um, might benefit. So we know that in situations where there's less, where there's, it's harsh situations, so abusive homes, violent neighborhoods, it's not adaptive to be trusting and to be relaxed. You can see on that diagram that if a child were to develop trust and be relaxed and um, believe in the best in everyone, but was in an environment which was physically dangerous, that child might not survive to actually procreate. So children who are vigilant, who might be aggressive, might be quick to react, might do better and might have an evolutionary advantage. This helps in the short term, but there's a cost to their long-term physical and mental health. And this is known as a fast life history strategy, which uh, Professor Bruno is going to talk about later in the afternoon as well. And then our main argument is that there's an evolutionary mismatch. So an evolutionary mismatch occurs when the environment in which an organism lives is significantly different from that in which it evolved. So that traits that were once adaptive may then become pathological. So a common example is around food. So we know that in evolutionary history, humans were very often faced with periods of very low food, with starvation. And those ancestors of ours who had genes which enabled them to eat and eat more than they wanted and really make use of times when there was plenty and therefore were able to save those reserves in body fat had a greater chance of surviving the next starvation episode. Now we are faced with plentiful food but we still have the evolutionary tendency to actually want to overeat, to want to um, save all that extra energy in body fat, and that this leads to a, a whole epidemic of obesity. 
This is due to a mismatch between the current environment and what people were um, evolutionarily adapted to be in. So the same argument can also be used for ADHD. If we think of the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, which is the time period when um, humans lived in nature over millions of years, you can see that, those ch that children then and all of us are not adapted to actually cope with modern schooling, which involves sitting still for at least five hours a day, five days a week, 200 days a year, paying attention, learning. Can you see the mismatch between the current environment compared to what, what we were evolved to be able to manage? And this is particularly an issue for boys, as we've said, because boys tend to have more ADHD. And it's made worse by the fact that schools in general are feminized institutions. So in the UK, we know that about 80% of teachers are female and that the environment is more geared towards girls in general and particularly ones who um, can sit still, concentrate, who are complacent, who don't want to explore, um, who are willing to be obedient. So the environment suits them very well, but it's to the detriment of the children with more ADHD traits who are active, who want to run around, who want to do something different. And this leads to uh, the arguments around ADHD treatment. So many clinicians argue that normal children are being medicated to make them less naughty and that this is a form of social control. Anti-psychiatry is a big in this and there is also evidence to show that Big Pharma has contributed, particularly in the United States, to ADHD being perhaps overdiagnosed. But we also know that medication sometimes really helps and it can ensure better educational outcomes, less involvement in drugs and youth offending. So there is this uh, real difficulty in deciding what to do. However, in practice, it doesn't really matter whether ADHD is a genetic or behavioral or neurodevelopmental disorder and whether it is under or overdiagnosed. Evolutionary thinking helps us see that the key question is, should a psychiatrist prescribe medication to help a child fit into an environment that is not ideal? I'm just going to stop there for a second, because when I initially realized this, I thought this was a groundbreaking idea. Because before, I was always thinking, well, this child well, there's definitely a family history, seems very biological, so probably medication is indicated. Whereas this other child, clearly lots of developmental trauma, perhaps in foster care, um, this is probably not ADHD, this is just being hypervigilant, being um, on edge, and therefore medication is not, not indicated, we should be thinking in terms of therapy. And what this evolutionary viewpoint has helped me realize is that those discussions and thoughts are actually not that important. What we need to think about is this child doesn't fit in this environment. There's a mismatch between the child's biology, the, the way the child is, and the environment they expected to function in. Now we know that when people uh, say that evolution is survival of the fittest, they don't, Darwin never said that, and it doesn't imply that it's the people who are fittest. What it means is that it's people who fit in best with their environment. So if you fit in very well with your environment, that gives you a survival advantage. So the question is, if we are faced with a mismatch between a child with ADHD traits and a school environment where they're expected to sit still and concentrate, what do we do? We can either medicate the child and try and change their biology, or we can try and change the school environment, 
or the family environment through therapy, or of course a combination of both. But whether the underlying reason lies in genes, epigenetics, neurodevelopment, doesn't really matter. What, what matters is to think about how we can lessen the mismatch. And it, in ethics, it, it really brings up interesting ethical dilemmas because it is questionable whether medication prescribing is justified when resources are lacking to change the home or school environment. So just because there isn't a behavior support service, because there isn't family therapy available, does that mean the child needs to take medication to change their biology to fit into an, an environment which isn't ideal? And often, especially in child psychiatry, there's a clear conflict of interest between what is best for the child and what is easiest for the parents and teachers. So I have got four vignettes of patients um, to illustrate the complexity around this. Um, these are not the right names, but these are people I have actually seen. So Alex is 17 years old. He was diagnosed with ADHD at age eight and treated with stimulant medication until he finished his GCSEs at age 16. He was able to stop using medication when he went to a football college. And I asked him why that was. And he said at football college, they do two hours of football training, then they go and do an hour of maths, then they do another two hours of football training, and then they do an hour of English. And with that amount of physical exercise, he was fine. He could sit still for an hour after he was running around for two hours doing football. And he was doing really well. He could stop his medication. Nine-year-old Joe was on a child protection plan due to neglect by his drug-abusing mother. And he was treated with stimulant medication for ADHD. He was placed in foster care his schoolwork improved dramatically and he was able to stop his medication. And I asked the foster carer, how is this possible? What, what has happened? And he said that he has changed the breakfast the child was getting. Because I always ask people, is your child eating breakfast before prescribing the stimulant medication? And his mother had assured me he was eating breakfast. The foster carer now told me that the breakfast the child had been getting was a can of Red Bull, an energized <laughs> caffeine drink, which has been a real learning experience for me. I don't just ask anymore whether people have breakfast, I now always ask what breakfast, because that was my, in my fantasy, the kind of breakfast she was giving him. So this child didn't have ADHD, he just was over caffeinated. Mohammed, 14 years old, was on the verge of exclusion due to his disruptive behaviors in class, fighting in the playground, and rudeness to teachers. He had been diagnosed with ADHD at age eight, but his parents had been opposed to medication. And they now agreed to a trial of stimulant medication. And he did extremely well. He said, finally, he was able to think before he acted. He had that space where if a teacher did something which irritated him, he didn't immediately respond like he used to do. He could actually first take a breath and think, is this worth it? He was able for the first time to play games where turn taking is required. He was able to think before talking to friends if he was annoyed. And most importantly, he could concentrate on his schoolwork. So he started doing really well. He started getting academic accolades. And both he and his family were delighted. And then this one is a tricky one. Seven-year-old Alfie was treated with short-acting methylphenidate to cover him at school, so just for um, six to eight hours. But neighbors in the flat below complained about his jumping around on evenings and weekends. And his mother was concerned as the neighbors were putting pressure on her and had made a complaint. So what would you do? This child, need, he has ADHD. He needs medication for school. 
But does he really need medication in the evenings and weekends? It's a tricky one. Ethical dilemma. Mum thankfully said that she was um, able to handle him, so she was fine with him just having the, the school cover, and she wasn't particularly um, keen on him taking medication all the time because she, she quite, uh, she was used to him being bubbly and energetic, but the neighbors were complaining. So in the end, what I did is I wrote a letter to housing to ask whether they could please transfer this family to a ground floor flat, knowing that that wouldn't happen because uh, there's a, a real deficiency. But I sent her two copies of that letter so that she could show one to the neighbor. And in that, I described that this child had ADHD and that he couldn't help. He needed lots of energy. I also told the mother to take him out when possible so that he could run around in a park. But this just, I thought this was a good example to show it doesn't really matter whether this child's ADHD is more biological, more um, social. What, what matters is it's the mismatch between the way the child is and the expectations of the environment. And how do you address that? Which, which is a, a helpful way of thinking about it. So in conclusion, an evolutionary perspective which points out the mismatch between biological predispositions and current environments, including schools, has a lot to add to debates about ADHD diagnosis and treatment. Understanding ADHD as a biological variant in some individuals that has adaptive value for living in unpredictable situations may help shift perceptions of the child being naughty to someone being caught in an evolutionary mismatch. So if you think of that little video I showed you, that little boy, at his age, I think most people would look at him and think, oh, he's so cute. But he'll continue to be that way. And by the time he's 12 or 16, people won't think that's cute anymore. Then they will start saying that he's naughty. They'll be giving him lots of negative feedback, which then leads to children often becoming oppositional, defiant, and sometimes developing conduct problems as well, dropping out of school. So there is a real need to be, for us all to advocate for children who are caught in this mismatch and think what we can do to help improve that. So in the longer term, certainly, we need to think how schools are run. A one-size-fits-all for schools doesn't fit particularly these boys with ADHD. An attempt should be made to adapt the environment before resorting to medication to adapt the individual. This talk is based on the paper uh, which was published in November um, by myself and colleagues Graham Music, Michael Rice and John Lorner, who's in the audience as well. Thank you, John. Uh, we have got handouts, um, but I don't think everybody got one. So if you, if you want one, please contact Graham, who's the corresponding author, and will be able to send you a PDF. We were very pleased to see that our paper um, influenced the choice of the front page of this journal in order to bring evolutionary mismatches to general attention. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Annie, for this uh, introduction and masterclass to clinical thinking, really. It brought to mind a wonderful book by someone called Jerome Groupman, who is or was professor of oncology in Johns Hopkins in the States. But he went around the United States uh, trying to think. Uh, the book is called How Doctors Think, and he was actually interested in errors in thinking amongst doctors. So he went around interviewing eminent doctors in the United States and he came across a, an eminent cardiologist and he tried to find out about his history. And the cardiologist said that when he was young, I don't remember what age, he was hyperactive. He was causing a lot of disruption in the class. And he was sent to a child psychiatrist. And the child psychiatrist said, 
He's too intelligent. He's bored. Take him up a year. <laughs> he said, the cardiologist said, if I went to Charles Psychiatrist now in the States, they would have prescribed medication. So uh, can I ask you, Annie, to repeat the questions so that they are recorded uh, as we go along? Yes, first question, Agnes. Thank you. The question is, how can we use the evolutionary understanding regarding ADHD to influence policy? I think the answer is going to be different in every country. I think um, in the UK, one of the authors on the paper, one of my co-authors, Michael Rice, is a professor of education. So that is something that we, would, that we are hoping to look at. Um, Part of giving this talk is to see if there's general interest in this, because I think what we need to do is to build up a, a baseline of people who will support that and who will, will take things further. Thank you. John. The question is whether the changes in the social culture and the use of electronic media is impacting on people's ability to pay attention for longer periods of time instead of flitting between different things. I'm not aware of any particular research in that area. I'm, I am aware that the, this is a hypothesis which I have read about previously because people do realize or, or think that ADHD, the prevalence increases on that from year to year and that is one of the possible underlying thoughts. Um, I'm afraid I can't give you more, info, more detail than that. I think there was a second arm to that question, which I think was about self-labeling through yes. social media. And I wondered what you might want to say about that. You're dealing with young adults, very late adolescents. Yes. The, so in, in child and adolescent psychiatry, for under 18-year-olds, we only diagnose ADHD based on, um, on triangulation, but not, not with social media, with the school and with the parents. But I know that with adults, that isn't always possible. There's also a big controversy around whether childhood ADHD continues and develops into adult ADHD. And there is newer research showing that some adult ADHD seems to occur de novo without having had a history of childhood ADHD. So there's lots of uncertainty in that area. I certainly often see people who've come, um, and children, who've come and self-diagnosed. What I've learned to do is to listen very carefully to them because sometimes they get it right. Not always, but it's worth um, considering it. Haven't you just made a strong case for single-sex schools? And I say this because when <coughs> I was at school... The question is whether I've made a strong case for single-sex schools. <laughs> if I have, it was completely inadvertent because I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not an advocate of single-sex schools. Um, but I do think that in increasing the amount of exercise uh, children get generally is a very good idea. And I do think that children should be given more choice. I don't think it should necessarily just be divided across gender. Um, first of all, because there are girls who have ADHD as well. There are lots of boys who don't and who would prefer to sit still and concentrate. And also with the recent changes around gender identity, I think that area of dividing people by sex is fraught with difficulties. The lady behind you. I'm influence of diet, particularly possibly um, mother's diets and epigenetic change for population. Um, looking at your paper very briefly today, you mentioned this tribe that has advantage in having traits of ADHD in terms of searching for food. And I wonder if actually we're becoming a society that's calorie rich but nutrient low, mm -hmm. and that that is leading to some epigenetic change in mothers of, of children that are born with with ADHD. Just wondered if that's something you've considered at all. I would certainly think that is a, a valuable point and something which is worth uh, researching further. My experience in the ADHD clinic is generally that diets are very poor. Um, not just the child's, but also the parents. So I regularly have conversations around vegetable and fruit and, and ask um, whether they have any in the home, um, often to be told that they don't. So I, I think there's definitely something in that. But as with most things, 
I think it's probably not the whole answer. I think there's lots of different things which contribute. It's my experience treating CAMS graduates and, and adults uh, with ADHD that there has to be a huge conversation about diet. And Absolutely. It's quite appalling sometimes. It's really quite an overwhelming impression. Mm. Uh, if we stay here, so make it easy for the microphone. There's someone at the end. Oh, well, here. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. One, just to follow up on the last point. Um, as opposed to just maternal diet, is there much socioeconomic gradient with ADHD prevalence? Because, like you say, if it's novelty seeking, and you gave the example of drought, perhaps early life malnutrition, or actually, in terms of having poor diet, you said you found in lots of patients, high levels of sugar, things that we consider poor diet, might actually be things which would protect against ADHD because they're sort of environmental cues that there's not much resource scarcity. But my question was, is there much socioeconomic gradient and do you think that perhaps signals of resource scarcity might lead to, in a, in a sort of life history approach, lead to this novelty seeking behavior? if that might be one of the principal drivers of how, how these behaviours are adapted? I think that is a, a difficult question to answer. I have no doubt that there are correlations, but whether there is causation is, is less clear. And certainly when we look at the evolutionary perspective, that's over thousands, um, hundreds of thousands of years. So I don't think that it's something we can apply in a particular case. Uh, except to look at the big picture and the history behind it. But from my, my um, professional experience, yes, I do think there is, there is a link. Um, but I think by the time students get to university, like a previous um, person asked, then you might get a switch because I also see people from high socioeconomic um, backgrounds who want their children on medication because they think it will give them that educational advantage. So there's not a clear picture. And just, the, just a second one to pull it up. You mentioned that it's high prevalence in boys. I didn't quite follow whether, do you have a sort of adaptive explanation for why we might expect this to be higher in boys or why in the EEA you would have thought? That? Yes, uh, we think that one of the possibili uh, possible explanations is that males have to compete more for mates in order to leave, um, to have descendants. And that might lead to males who are novelty seeking, who are more inclined to take risks, who are more impulsive, having a greater chance of actually leaving offspring. So that, and, and then for those genes to be more prevalent in the population. But this is a hypothesis. We don't have, a, have proof for that. There's a gentleman at the end of the row there before I come back to this side. Thank you. Um, just a question about the neurochemistry of that. Because you mentioned DRD4 uh, as novelty seeking. And we know, for example, another example you mentioned is the uh, food seeking experience, which is linked to uh, nucleus accumbens, D2 receptors, and so on. So would it be. Uh, possible to hypothesize that dopamine receptor genes are involved in evolutionary, underpin evolutionary processes. And second question is, we um, have experience of um, frequently seeing people with ADHD of an adult age. They report to have had ADHD as kids, but they were not treated. And they usually do reasonably well. So I'm wondering, out of a purely naturalistic experience, whether the, um, let's say, societal mismatch is growing as the years go, so the environment is becoming more hostile to people with this kind of traits. So we know with dopamine, it's the reward center. So we know that people who can delay gratification um, do better in life. They tend to, to uh, be able to plan more long term and that with ADHD uh, people struggle to do that. But equally, if you come from an environment which is dangerous and where you might die, it might be stupid to be delaying gratification because you might die before you actually gain your goal. So it's, it's a mixed picture. 
And your second question, I think my, my personal opinion is yes. I do think that lots of people say when they were at school, they didn't have to work so hard, um, they didn't have to be so, so um, studious, and they still managed to to get the marks or to, to do what they wanted to do, whereas now there is extremely high competition. People are very, very anxious, particularly I know in the UK, I don't know whether that's also the case in other countries. So it's, it may well be that the academic requirements of schools um, are, are more stringent now uh, than they used to be. I wonder though whether for some people the social media and the mobile society business actually there is lessening mismatch for a subgroup of people uh, but that's a matter for further research so hello um, I'm a child psychiatrist too and I, I blame the Education Act 1871 for creating <laughs> ADHD um, but also I, I have a, a bit of a maybe an extension would you agree that this is compatible with a, a warrior hypothesis that we have selected for people who are excellent warriors because they have endless energy they have ability to scan the environment which is the inattentiveness or lack of focus or ability to scan the environment which is great in a battlefield an old-fashioned battlefield and also um, the lack of sleep. When's your enemy most likely to kill you? It's mm -hmm. when you're asleep. So if you're a sentry and don't need much sleep, you're more likely to survive. Does that fit? Absolutely, it fits beautifully. So the, um, just to repeat that, the warrior hypothesis, I have read about that as well, that people with ADHD might do particularly well. And we know that, that people with ADHD do well in, in jobs where um, there's high physical expectations, quick decision making, like the military, sports, and, and there may well be an evolutionary background to that in selecting people who, who could do that. And the, le the lack of sleep certainly is also very, very uh, common in ADHD and, uh, populations. England has been at war with virtually every country you can think of. <laughs> <laughs> so the lady behind has been very patient. I find your talk very interesting and I love the evolutionary idea and how it's beneficial in some situations. And I wonder, could we apply those thoughts to um, other things like uh, substance misuse if you live in a or work in a very socially deprived area, mm. maybe misuse of substances is a short-term survival mechanism. Yes. Um, but what I wanted to ask you about was, there's been a lot of talk about schooling. In an ideal world, the ideal society, should we be choosing the school for the child rather than, uh, you know, we've got catchment areas, and I come from a city where everyone is obsessed with catchment areas. Should we be choosing the school for the child in an ideal world? And looking at that ideal, if that is the ideal situation, how would we model our education in a practical way to fit that ideal as best we can? My personal view is yes, we should be doing that. But again, it's, it's not always possible. So because of the way um, catchment areas fall, and also in one family you might have children who have very different requirements and different needs. I know that some people um, actually do do that, and I have a friend who has three children who are in three different schools, um, which suiting their character, but that's not always possible for everyone. So again, it's a trade-off between what would be ideal and what's doable. The gentleman here, please. Question. One at the back and the final period. Um, <clears throat> sorry, thank you for that <coughs> uh, talk, Dr. Swanpool. I mean, I guess my question is that in some ways one of the things which you highlighted in the presentation was that the etiology, whether it's biologically determined or environmentally determined, is relatively peripheral. And I guess how do you reconcile that with our drive for a much more scientifically valid diagnostic criteria and classification system because I think it is really pertinent that there are these huge variations in prevalence. I mean, if we are saying that it doesn't matter whether it's biological, it doesn't matter whether it's environmental, then what should be, why should we be kind of even thinking about uh, going for research? And I come back to 
uh, when I was a trainee and you read about the international pilot study of schizophrenia and it was done in seven centers and pretty much the prevalence rates and everything were very much similar. Uh, so I guess that's what, you know, I'm coming from a slightly different perspective. From the evolutionary thinking, what we're trying to do is to promote both and to promote the integration because there's no way we can look at anything in isolation and say this is purely biological and that is purely environmental and that is what epigenetics has shown us. So I certainly didn't want to give the impression that I'm saying science and research isn't important. What I'm saying is it's extremely important but we need to look at the whole picture. We can't just be focusing on one thing. And it's going to be the last question, I'm afraid. Are you aware of any animal models of ADHD? And would animal models in relatively fast breeding species give us an opportunity to test evolutionary hypotheses? You make me think of a book uh, which we have in child psychiatry clinics. All dogs have ADHD. <laughs> Compared. So. So the question was around animal models, whether there are animal models for ADHD and whether that could be useful. The, um, so there's a book, uh, there's another book which says all cats are autistic, um, <laughs> but all dogs have ADHD. I think people, people understand where that's coming from, the exuberance, the hyperactivity, the impulsivity. I haven't read any research around particular animal models for ADHD, so I'm afraid I can't, can't answer the a basic science question. Okay, Annie, thank you very much. That was a really excellent introduction to the morning.